grace to you all this morning and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. About three years ago, Mary and my wife and I had the really good fortune of traveling to Alaska. And we flew into Anchorage and the next day took a bus up to um, Denali, um, formerly known as Mount McKinley. We got there kind of late in the afternoon. We knew that um, there was a viewing platform out behind the lodge where we were staying. And so we rushed out there with our family because we wanted to catch a glimpse of this highest peak in North America, right? We knew it was going to be really awesome. We got out there and we're looking, it's a little overcast, and we're looking and there's this mountain range off in the distance and we're kind of like, was that it? Is that, that one looks a little taller, is that it? And we finally um, kind of gave up because we didn't really see it. We couldn't pick it out of all those mountains. I went, I went over to an employee of the lodge and I said, which one of those is Denali? And he said, oh, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> okay. So we went to bed and the next morning we woke up and again we went out onto the back deck of the lodge and there, filling the skyline was Denali. It was awesome. And we just stopped and we stared and we took this in because it was more than we could imagine or anticipate. It just took our breath away. It was really an incredibly moving sight. Um, and then, of course, you know, everybody gets out their cell phones and they're taking pictures of Denali, trying to capture the awesomeness of this site in some way that they could bring it with them. But I'll never forget that moment. It just totally overwhelmed me with a sense of awe and, and greatness, the power of that mountain. And I hope that as I tell this story, you can identify moments in your own lives where you have that sense of being just overwhelmed and full of awe at the wonderful things that have been happening to you that were, were in your presence. I'm going to guess that some days, as you look at this little guy, you totally lose track of time. <coughs> right? Just awesome, right? This incredible miracle that has come into your lives. That is a, a result of your love for each other and God's love for you. Um, you must want to just stand there, right? And freeze that moment. And I guess there are maybe a few pictures of Grayson out there in the world. <laughs> you don't have to show me your cell phones. I know you've got like tons of them, right? To capture the moment that is beyond capturing this wonderful miracle of life that, that is yours, right? That is a gift. Right? How awesome that is. How awesome. I think about the reading from Acts, where um, Jesus, after his resurrection, is ascending up into heaven, and his disciples have gathered around, and, and they want to freeze the moment. They want to stay there with Jesus, because the miracle of his resurrection has totally transformed their understanding of everything, totally reoriented their lives in a new direction. The fact that there could be life after death has made them full of awe and wonder at the glory and love and mercy of God. And, and all they want to do is just stand there for a moment. Now, this was 2,000 years ago, so none of them whipped out their cell phone and, and got a picture of Jesus' feet as he's going up into the heavens. But they probably wanted to freeze that moment, and no doubt they did in their hearts and in their minds. They just wanted to stand there full of awe and wonder at this miraculous sight. But it wasn't to be. Two men up here behind them, we recognize from Luke's gospel that they must be angels because of their dress and their kind of miraculous appearance. And they say to the men of Galilee, what are you looking at? And it wasn't because they didn't know, but it was because the men of Galilee and the women and the disciples and all those gathered there at the ascension of Jesus needed to be reoriented once again. Needed to get back to the realities of life as it needed to be lived. Need to remember Jesus' words that now they had a job to do. I suspect that if you're staring at this beautiful little baby and he starts to cry, you remember, oh, he has needs too, right? We can't just freeze this moment. We're called here to be mom and dad, and we've got to take care of those needs of hunger or cleanliness. I'm, I'm back. I stared at Denali three years ago, but there was life to be lived after that, right? And we capture those moments in our hearts, and then we go back into the life that call, God calls us to live together. And we seek in that life at our best to be faithful, to walk the walk that Christ has invited us to, and never walk that walk alone, but always in the company of God's Spirit, in the company of that same Jesus who was resurrected and who has ascended, in order to fill all of creation. All of creation, including us in our lives, in our hearts, in our spirits. 
to fill us with work to do. Work to do for the sake of the world. Among the probably uncountable moments you guys are having, and will have, and it just gets better and better. Has anybody told you yet, by the way, um, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems? <laughs> they have, really, they even give you a little while to just relax and enjoy this beautiful baby? No, right. It's not true. It, the joys just get more and more all the time as this little guy grows and, and, and you see the wonderful things like, like that first step. There's going to be another moment, right, guys, when you're just going to freeze there and be like, oh my gosh, he walked. And it's going to be so awesome. And that's just the beginning of the transformation of your lives because of this miracle. Isn't that awesome? But there's work to do, right? There's work to do. And as we celebrate this awesome occasion today and Grayson's baptism, well, here's what you're promising. I'll just remind you that you're making a commitment to him and to God that this baptism, which is so beautiful, is a beginning. And that you are going to promise, along with his godparents, to bring him to God, to raise him among God's people, to teach him about God's presence in his life through very specific means of the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to pray for him. So that he, in turn, now you ready for this? This little guy is going to learn to trust God, to proclaim Christ, to care for others in the world God made, and to work for justice and peace. And that starts today. That's pretty, that's pretty wild, right? Proclaim Christ, care for others in the world, work for justice and peace. That doesn't happen overnight. That's the progress of our life of faith. As we live in that trust, we learn to talk about what that means to us. We share those moments of awe with others so that they can, too can experience God's presence in their lives. We work to care for people and for all of this wonderful creation that God has given us. And we strive for justice and peace. And in this wonderful kind of Irony that God um, often places into our lives, and God is nothing if not ironic, sisters and brothers. Um, right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. Um, our example is in grace. That wonderful trust, that vulnerability, that openness, and that confidence that he has in you, that he's going to be okay, that he's well cared for. Well, God loves you like Katie and Dane love their little guy. And can we have that same confidence? Can we look at Grayson coming to this moment of baptism and say, oh yeah, that's me. And I can trust that God is with me and loves me and cares for me. You know, there's, there's this funny story about a pastor who's preaching a children's sermon. And, um, and he wants to talk to them about a tree. I'm, I'm sorry, he wants to talk to them about a squirrel. So he says to the kids, the kids that got around, he says to them, he says, what do you call that, um, that little animal that lives in trees? And none of the kids say anything. He says, well, you know, the one that gathers nuts and stores them over the winter, and still the kids don't say anything. It's got a bushy tail, and still the kids don't say anything. And the pastor says, you don't, you don't know what the answer is? And the kids say, well, I know the answer is always Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, the answer is always Jesus. And for 35 years, that's all I've had to give, right? That word, that central affirmation of our faith, that Jesus is present and committed to our lives. And, and there's nothing new. And there's nothing old about that. That wonderful, transformative presence of Jesus. And because of that, my sisters and brothers, dear members of this household of faith, all of you gathered here today, there's work to be done. There's work to be done that is empowered and supported by the Holy Spirit. And as much as we'd like to just stand for as long as we can, staring up 
at the feet of Jesus or into the face of this beautiful baby or into the wonders of creation, there's work to be done. As much as we like to freeze and capture this particular moment, there's work to be done. And the God who loves us into that work and the confidence that we never do it alone, but we do it together. We do it as a community of faith. And when we cannot walk, others hold us up and help us to walk alongside them. So hold on to this moment. Hold on to this wonderful time in Grayson's life. Hold on to the holiness of this moment. But then let's get to work. Because the world needs what we have. The world needs to hear the proclamation of that word. The world needs what we have to share. And it's only one thing. And it is enough. It is Jesus. Amen.